we're very familiar in the, in the Buddhist tradition, though, with cause and conditions. And there's a whole sutra that's just written about this issue. So you can read a great deal about cause and conditions. In one sense, um, you can say that the Buddhists believe that cause is, is the primary cause of something, and conditions are the secondary and necessary, but not sufficient. That is, you can have a multitude of conditions, it still won't happen, because there's no efficient cause that finally makes it happen. So I can say that in order for my car to run, I have to have the car, I have to have the motor, I have to have the gas, I have to have the key, all these conditions. But even if I have all those conditions, there has to be some point at which there is an efficient cause that I actually turn it on, start the motor, and it becomes a running car. So. Conditions and cause are, are big issues, and they are different, and so we are constantly in the Buddhist tradition trying to determine between them. The one talk about cause that is best known, of course, is that there is nothing that is not dependently existent. And so for that reason, the text says there is nothing that is not empty. And they often use the TP or the tripod to say, you have to have at least three sticks that go together in order for it to stand up. You take one of them away and it won't stand, it will collapse. So everything in the Buddhist sense has to arise in relationship to something else. And there is nothing that they can see that arises independently. There's no possible way of seeing something that doesn't have cause and conditions. We as humans are, are just living examples of this incredible causal and conditional world. You think about all the conditions that are necessary for us to be born. You think about all the conditions that are necessary for us to all be in this room. It becomes billions. <laughs> it goes out of sight so that we are constantly trying to figure out how it is that we can deal with causation because nothing is caused without dependency. And that's so well known in Buddhism that it almost becomes trite. And you gotta watch it when something becomes so familiar, as you know, familiarity breeds contempt. <laughs> becomes so familiar to people that, and it just trips off our tongue. Everything has cause and conditions, everything arises dependent on something else, and we can say that and go ahead and lead our lives without really thinking about the implications of it. So today, part of this lecture is to think about the implications of this in terms of what emptiness has to do with causation and how that comes about. The texts tell us that whatever is impermanent is subject to change. And then they go ahead to the next stage, whatever is subject to change is subject to suffering. Suffering also can be translated as another idea which is uh, that I'm not satisfied. Dissatisfaction. The word in Sanskrit can either be dissatisfaction. We've made it a little harsher because we use the word suffering for the Sanskrit word dukkha, but impermanence and change brings about dissatisfaction. So we look at life and we're dissatisfied because it always leads to old age. And then we're told old age is not for sissies. 
that's probably true. <laughs> the dissatisfaction that we feel is that we're very content if things would just stay firm. If you own a house, I think you understand that absolutely and completely. I built it. My wife and I had a house built. Now it's uh, 26 years ago. Well, at the time, everything was new. All the, the whole house was brand new. And even the appliances were brand new. Now, 26 years later, they are all old at the same time. And it's just terrible because every week something breaks, something stops working. <laughs> and it's like I am dissatisfied because this change is causing me a lot of suffering and it's also wrecking my budget. And we're not going to have enough money to eat if things keep breaking. Just before I uh, left on a trip, we have this fancy system we had to put in for our septic because we're not on the sewer system. The alarm went off just as I left the house to go get in the car and go to the airport. Oh. <laughs> Which says, the system no longer is working. <laughs> so when I came back, I had a $4,000 bill and I thought, I am dissatisfied with this. <laughs> I am suffering because it's changing. It's all falling to pieces now that it's gotten older. So whatever is subject to change is subject to this kind of dissatisfaction. The Buddhists were well aware of that, and that is part of the teaching and why they put a lot of focus on change, causal relationships. Because if you're going to solve suffering and dissatisfaction, you have to deal with causation. One of the great problems about cause is can you have constant change and persistence? So in the Greek logic, there is the ship of Theseus. The ship of Theseus has been reconstructed so many times in the story that it no longer has a single piece of the original ship in it. Is it then still the ship of Theseus? Same thing happens, I was studying Korean monasteries. I started looking at the history of one of the great gateways. I started looking to see that it had been rebuilt eight times. I watched them rebuild it. I watched them take out all the rotten wood and just substitute new wood. And when I figured it all out, I thought, when they tell me this is a 13th century gate, I don't think there is a piece of the 13th century gate left in this. Is it the gate? What gate is it? Is it the ship of Theseus? If you have this kind of complete change Where's the persistence? Am I justified in saying this is a 13th century gate? Or am I lying? Am I justified in saying this is the ship of Theseus? It's not got a single piece of the original, but I'm still going to say it's a ship. Well, it's OK for gateways and ships. We can take it or leave it. <coughs> However, what about me? If I have changed so completely, and they now say every one of us, every seven years, will lose every atom we have in our body right now. So I'm not the person I was seven years ago in terms of any of the structure that's in me. I don't probably have a single atom still left in me that I had seven years ago. But I feel persistence. I have been replaced many times since I'm such an old person. 
I've been replaced many, many times. I still feel persistence. So what is that persistence when there is such dramatic and total change? There is a reconstruction that is absolutely complete, and yet we don't feel that we have lost it. A lot of this has to do with our projections. So long as the conjunction stays very similar, we imply from our look at ourselves, it's still me. That's our interpretation. Looks like me, almost. I can still see a little of the old Lou in this old face. I'm having, though, <laughs> I'm having a crisis. I have a picture in my study of my great-grandfather. And the reason I have it is my mother gave it to me because I look just like him. It's like looking at a portrait of myself. Now, he's always in the picture through the years. I've looked at this picture of this old man who still looks like me. I have now become 10 years older than he was when that picture was taken. <laughs> So he's now looking young. <laughs> and I'm, I'm faced with this horrible thought. I'm now, I'm, I'm aging beyond him, and, and he's getting to be just a kid on the wall. And for years, he was this old man on my wall that looked like me. We're, we are, we face with change. And we faced with this issue of continuity, and we, we are faced with how in the world we deal with these two things that go hand in hand, but yet seem so difficult for us to really comprehend. And that's why when Professor Pearl says, causation is just a mystery. What's happened to us? What, what happens when we change? What, what is the force that's behind it, if there is one, or is there? Well, the Buddhists have the doctrine of moments. That is, events occur momentarily. Everything is momentary. And because the events of the moment appear together, they seem to match our expectations. My expectation is tomorrow morning I'm going to get up and look in the mirror and I will look the same to me as I looked this morning, maybe. I, my expectation is that that will be the case and lo and behold I probably will get up, look in the mirror and my expectation will be met. Aha, that's, I'm still there. But well, we have the old thought about a river, which, of course, the Greeks had too. And they said, you can never step in the same river twice. The river you stepped in before has already gone all the way to the ocean. What you're now stepping in is a brand new river. But because of my expectation, every time I go to this river, I, I say, oh, I, this is what I remember. This is the way this river looks. When I come here, it's got this waterfall. It has this same flow of water. It's my river. I love this river. It's always here for me. But of course, in the doctrine of moments, that river in every single nanosecond is changing. And as these moments are, are appearing in a staccato-like blink of the eye, my expectation that the river will still be there turns out to be seemingly supported by my observation. So we're like the river. We're changing and flowing, and the atoms are flowing through us all the time. And we are never able to be the same person from one moment to the next. Somebody asked me, so why aren't you teaching about reincarnation? And do you believe in re reincarnation? 
I had that same question at the prison. One of the prisoners asked me that he had a lot of trouble with reincarnation and could, but he asked it in a, in a very interesting way. He asked me, would, would you convince me that it's so? <laughs> he didn't ask me to explain it to him. He, he really did. He said, it's like, I want to believe it, so convince me. <laughs> Tell me so that I can believe it, because it seems like a nice thing to believe. And particularly somebody in his position, I think. So I decided to do the doctrine of the moments. And I said, well, in one sense, you are reborn every moment. Your body changes every moment. You're a new thing. And yet there's persistence. You carry with you, in those moments, seemingly you carry with you all the baggage of your whole life. You don't lose it in that momentary change. So that we watch ourselves being transmuted moment by moment by moment, and yet we somehow maintain the memories of the past, we maintain our, our traits, we maintain the ways in which we can do things, we maintain what we're capable of doing, we have all of this. So I said to him, if you have trouble with long-term rebirth, just accept it as, as a momentary event. You're being reborn. You just did it. You just did it. You just did it. You just did it. And yet, my expectations are being met. All of you look just like you looked 10 seconds ago. And I suspect that you feel that you have carried in those 10 seconds of great change, you have carried all kinds of things with you. You have not lost the form of the gate. You have not lost the form of the river. It looks the same. It seems as if it has all the attributes. This moment, this moment, this moment. The thing which amazes me most in the world, I think, is gravity. I still don't really truly understand gravity. But if I go up to a cliff and push a rock over and it falls off the cliff, then I can say, here's efficient action. I went up to the edge of the cliff and there was a rock and I pushed it, a force, and it fell. And there was a succession of moments as it went down, down, down until it hit the bottom and there was a great boom. I have no problem with saying, I caused that. And I see that what I caused was I caused the rock to fall. But with gravity, that's not what happens. It does appear to us to fall, of course, and it does fall. But gravity says that two bodies in gravity are attracted to one another. The ground is attracted up as the rock comes down. The two are being, are attracted so that the Buddhist concept that things don't happen independently, in a way, gravity is like that. You can't have gravity just being one way. Gravity is this. So even if I step on the earth. It, to my utter amazement, the earth is attracted a little tiny bit to my foot. Otherwise, my foot wouldn't touch it. In other words, a person, as it says, pulls up the earth with a force equal to their own weight. Think about that for a moment we are in a situation where we are so intertwined in gravity 
that whatever I do with regard to something else, the other thing has to also be reacting in an equal way. It is attraction. So if an asteroid heads for the Earth, we think it's just a one-way three thing. This asteroid is smashing through space, but the Earth is being attracted toward it. We wouldn't perceive it. We only know it through sometimes mathematics, but it actually <coughs> is occurring. That's gravity. So, you see somebody breaking bricks or breaking boards in martial arts. It appears that the hand comes down with such force that that force causes the boards to break. And it does. However, before the boards break, they push back. And that's what injures your hand if you do it. What injures your hand is gravity. But the gravity is not in your hand. The gravity is the board pushing back. That's what causes the in injury. An injury is a mixture of two things. It is the downward motion and the attraction. And nothing is happening just by itself. It is not just that hand moving down. I had a, a student, <laughs> uh, he, he was in Beijing early on, and, and they had just decided that they would allow people to hear about martial arts. He was at the Beijing, Peking University in Beijing, they call it Peking University still. And so they had student night, and he said, I'm going to break uh, boards, because I'm a black belt. But he said he got very nervous about going on the stage in front of you know, like 5,000 students who were out there, and they were all fascinated to see this American come out and show his power of breaking. And when he went out, he, he did it, and it didn't break. Mm -hmm. And he tried it again, and it didn't break. And finally, they begged him to leave the stage. <laughs> you know, his hand was getting bloody from this. And he realized, of course, I haven't emptied my mind. I am thinking I need to use my strength to break those boards. So he, he sat down and he meditated for a bit and really cleared his mind. And then to their horror, he walked back out on the stage without permission and broke the boards. It was a recognition that when what you have in this is you cannot think I'm going to do it and you do it. And in a sense that's what gravity teaches us. It's this coming and going of the gravity which we become part of to such a degree that the force itself will work. So he could do it, but he couldn't think about doing it. He could only do it. He couldn't have a concept, I'm going to break the boards. I watch these kids, on, sometimes on an airplane they have snowboarding uh, shorts, doing incredible things. I'm sure they're about to kill themselves. And but suddenly they can stop. And I've never quite understood how that could happen, except the, the edge of their board pushes against the snow, but the snow pushes back against the board. It's gravity. They are, they are just participating in the normal force of gravity, and with the, uh, equal force to what they put forward, the snow pushes back equally. It's not just their control, it's the Earth itself pushing back. Well, gravity, the other thing which amazes me is gravity affects time. T 
time doesn't, is not the same everywhere. So if you're in an airplane flying because you have less gravity, your clock will run a little faster than a clock on the ground. You may not notice it because it's rather small, but it does because gravity bends time. It bends it so that as you fly, you will have nanoseconds difference from somebody who's directly underneath you on the ground where the gravity is heavier. And to some degree, which is hard to believe, <coughs> time is slightly different at the equator than it is here in this latitude. Because the gravity at the equator is at its smallest. That's where there's the least amount of gravity. So we're, we live in an environment where time and place and the reaction and the interpenetration of things is happening all the time. Causality is not just a one-way street. That's why it's such a mystery, because it's not just a force that goes forward like this. It's, it's a force that is attracted. So there's an equal force that comes from the other side. And that changes where you are in the world. So the conditions are, are crucial to it. What you have in one place will not be what you have in another place. We think these are all universals. The more we look at them, we begin to see they're not. The conditions shift, they shift. So that's why I find gravity is, is something which I really wish I knew more about. <laughs> I loved it. I don't know if you remember in Apollo 15. Secretly, they, the astronauts took on board a hammer and a feather. They weren't supposed to do this. I don't know how they did it, but they snuck them into the spaceship. And then when they got onto the moon, they said, we're going to see if Galileo was correct when he said that objects in gravity fall at the same speed regardless of their weight. The only difference is the condition where, like a feather, is deterred by the force of air because of the way it is. But if you're in absolute gravity, they will fall at the same speed. So the astronauts decided the moon is as close as we'll ever get to a pure vacuum. So let's see, they took a hammer and they took a feather and on TV, or when they were recording it, he dropped it. And you can see it on YouTube if you want. And they do, they land on the moon surface at exactly the same moment. Gravity is not dependent upon the absolute weight of something, that's not what gravity is all about. We think it is. We think the heavier the thing is, faster it's going to fall. But in a vacuum, no, it's not the case. Vacuum is where gravity was working perfectly, and the weight means nothing. They fall at exactly the same speed. So I talked about vacuum before in terms of how important it is to somehow clear out things so that you can have a pure thing in which to test. And that like the great machine in, in Switzerland, you need, in order to test, you've got to make it as close as you can to a perfect vacuum. Or you've got to go into outer space where vacuum comes as close as we can come. It's not a complete vacuum, but it's close. The other thing that we have is, is a big thing, association and cause. We are very easily deceived by something correlations. We see something standing with something else, and we say, aha, that's what's causing this. And 
So you have symptoms. Do the symptoms cause illness? And sometimes you would think that's the way a doctor is operating because the only medicine they will give you is for the symptom. Have you ever thought about that? Why should I take just a medicine for the symptom? It'll make me feel better, but what I really want is something that will cure the illness, right? And the symptom is not the cause of the illness, so I can cure the symptom, but it won't even touch the illness itself. I told you I have this numb foot. They say, we can't do anything about it. You just have peripheral neuropathy. Sorry for you, but that's, it's not life-threatening. But we can give you something that will make it feel better, but we can't give you anything to cure it. And then you say, what are the side effects to what you're giving me to make me feel better? You know, well, death and <laughs> liver failure and things like that. <laughs> Thank you, but no, <laughs> don't need that. So what is it when we have all of these things that seem to come together? I have to say, when I read uh, new medical advice in the newspaper, very often the problem with those articles is they seem to be describing that there are things which are correlational, and they're uh, implying that they're causal. So for example, there was an article in the paper which a lot of people really picked up on. Men who drink red wine live longer. Well, I'm sorry, I'm just doing this for my health's sake. <laughs> then somebody said, but wait a minute. It's true, but if you add something else to the equation, you can get the reverse. This is called Simpson's Paradox. You can have a correlation where it really is the case. You add a third one, and it'll reverse. So for example, if you add to this that men who drink red wine tend to be better educated than the norm, have better health coverage, and have more money. Among that group of people, health is better, but among that group of people, when you only do your study with them, that is men who have that income, who have that health coverage, who have that support system, those who drink red wine live shorter lives. It reverses. You add another one, and it will reverse. It's like they did a study that said uh, boys who smoke uh, don't make as good grades. So there's a correlation between smoking and grades. But you could add a third dimension to that, which is boys whose mothers smoke um, make <coughs> lower grades, and if you deal with where you have add that other dimension to it, it will reverse so that in, the, in many cases where you've got a situation of parents who smoke and children who smoke, the children in those environments, those are the only ones you test for, the ones who are in that environment where the parents smoke, the non-smokers make better grades. In other words, by adding another dimension to your, your correlations, so we should be really careful that this is not what the Buddhists mean by cause and conditions. Conditions are the things that stand with the situation, but if you take those conditions to be causal, I think you run, it, run into the same issue that you have with these correlational studies. The conditions are not the cause. They are necessary. You've got to have them, maybe, but 
but they are not efficient. They are not sufficient, we say. They are not sufficient to bring it about. So what is the cause of illness? I could say that one cause of illness are microbes. Microbes get into the body and they cause all kinds of havoc. And so we could say illness is caused by microbes. On the other hand, you can have a stroke which is not microbial and you'll also get sick. So the question is, what kind of cause are we looking for when we say, is there one cause for illness? We'd like to say germs, but there are many causes for illness. And sometimes a person can have uh, the germs in their body and not be ill. How do we understand how to fully understand cause? That's why when Pearl says, it's a great mystery. We just don't know whether it's a force that's in there or whether we see something that happens. We're not quite sure why it happened, but we project on it. I have just observed cause and effect because this thing happened and then this thing happened. So, of course, in logic, they all taught us you're standing looking across the fields. You see smoke coming out of a train, and then you hear a whistle. And you say, aha, the smoke calls the whistle. It came first in my vision, and then I later heard the whistle. But that has to do with the speed of our sense organs. We're seeing always much faster than we're hearing. So consequently, we are constantly being presented with a visual followed by an auditory, and then if we're not careful, we're gonna say, my visual must have caused the auditory because it came before it. And then there's another one with, you hear the rooster crow and the sun rises. The rooster always crows before the sunrise, so therefore, there must be a causal relationship. It's not so much that the rooster is causing the sun to rise, it's that we are looking at correlations and we are implying causal because one comes before the other. So we have to be very careful when we see one thing happen and then another thing happen, we jump, we say, to a conclusion. And that's, that is where we get into deep trouble often. We jump to a conclusion before we really know what the total mechanism of it is. And sometimes we can never find out that full mechanism. Things can change. Um, you can become a sister if you have a sibling. You become a brother if you have a sibling. But it doesn't change you. In other words, part of what we see in life as change is like you can become a father or a mother from the birth of a child, but you're not really changed. But you can't be a father without or a mother without a child. So the Buddhists are always saying things arise together, but they're empty of their own essential nature. There is nothing essentially of essential in fatherness or motherness. They just arise together with the child, so they're empty. It's not that, that I am changed because I have a sibling. But without the sibling, I can never be a brother. It happens at the same moment but empty of any essentialness in me, just because the two things are required. They have to happen together. So that's why the Buddhists are constantly saying, things that arise because they are together with something else are always without an essential nature. 
They're always without it, no matter what you say, how you deal with it. I think one of the biggest problems we have in our country today is that we're having an enormous national debate, which is a tele teleological argument about the cause of the world. What causes all of this is the big debate. What brought about this world in which we live? So the watch has become, the analogy of the Swiss watch is that a watch requires an intelligent designer. You can't have a watch without the complexity of that watch being put together by an intelligent designer. And this is part of the way in which people who want to support intelligent design say, if we think that it took an intelligent designer to build a watch, then think about the universe. But as the people who deal in logic or want to say, a watch and the universe are not equivalent. A watch can only work because it has no real randomness. That's why the Swiss are said to be so precise. There can be no randomness. You have to construct that watch exactly, or if it's a little bit off, it won't keep good time. But the universe is irrational. It's random. We can't spot any pattern in it in, in the normal sense. If you say that the watch must be made by an intelligent designer because it's so precise, <coughs> the universe, by those who are now talking in these terms, the universe shows none of the attributes of a watch. There is no predicting the next moment for the universe. It's one to many. It could do anything in one sense. So that the teleological argument is based on these kinds of arguments that I'm describing to you, and it all took place in the 2005 court case, a court case in the Dover area school district uh, was brought about because the school board decided that teachers had to teach creationism in the public schools. And they had to teach that Darwin and evolution was just a theory that's unproved. They wanted to teach the children that things were, came into existence intact. Fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers and beaks and wings, etc. And they wanted this taught in the public school. So some of the parents took them to the, to the court. They never got to the Supreme Court, but they took them to federal court and said, they are forcing us to teach our children something in science which is not scientific. And they must prove to us that what they're asking us to teach in science is scientific. Well, the case attracted enormous amount of attention. It was seen by both sides of the issue that this would help decide what education in the country would be with regard to cause. Causality was on the line. Millions of dollars began to be poured into this campaign. People from all over the country came to support one side or the other in the battle. The decision came down, and it has stood. The decision from the judge who happened to be a very devout Christian Republican, <laughs> which helped, I think. <laughs> uh, 
uh, because it was not a somebody who could be said to have been prejudiced the other way. He came down and he said, I see no science in what the creationists have presented. And his ruling was that this cannot be taught as science. And you must take it out of the curriculum. Uh, but this argument and this debate is still raging. So what we're talking about here is not something that's just in textbooks or just in logical, complex logic classes in universities. We are truly talking about something that is besetting our whole idea of what cause is and how we should teach our children about it. And the judge ruled that, is, that he believed that those who were pushing for the intelligent design were really pushing their religious beliefs in God and that they had no other argument to make for it and he just he, he ruled the other way. Um, so far the case has not been appealed. It could go to the Supreme Court sometime and it might still but it has not been appealed. So we are, we are always faced with two things, the rational and the empirical. And when we're talking about cause with the empirical, it's static. In other words, when I have a statistic, it's set. But when I am talking about ca the causal analysis, I really am talking about changing conditions. I think about this in modern day. We have what's called big data now. Everything is big data. Big data is statistical for the most part. When you search through something, you're counting. For example, Google counts how many hits they get in order to determine what's happening to the flu epidemic every year in the country. If millions of people look up aspirin, they figure the flu is spreading, and they've got an algorithm. But this year they were 50% off, and it was hard for them to understand how in past years they've been relatively close, not really that close, but relatively, last year completely off. Because if you just take big data and you grab a static uh, collection of counts from that big data, and then you infer from it that it's true and everywhere, you can have big error. The bigger your data and statistics, the bigger your potential is for error. So what Spock and Sherlock Holmes have taught us is that causal analysis is based on changing conditions. So I like to use the word, rather than big data, I'm trying to involve myself in long data. Long data to me is data which is based on changing conditions and changing context, not just grabbing a single snapshot of a count from big data, because it's when I use my rational mind that I begin to maybe have a better look at what's happening. I know you've all heard this one. It's, it's so fun, though. 100% of all people exposed to water will die. <laughs> Statistically, that's true, right? 100% <laughs> of all serial killers, rapists, and drug dealers have admitted to drinking water. <laughs> Shows you how dangerous water is. Water is the leading cause of drowning. By the time you get the facts about water, it's not something you would want to have in your house 
or introduce to your children or even touch, right? The facts, but the facts are static because until those facts get put into some kind of context, you don't know what to do with them. That's not a causal analysis. In other words, dying is not caused by drinking water normally. The conditions are what you need to look at. For me, I've been working on mapping for long, long years, and I have learned without any question that you cannot derive a cause from distribution. For example, if you look at the map of the religions of India, you cannot, from just a map of distribution of the religions, come up with any kind of explanation. There is no causal analysis that you can make about that map unless you have other information in order to make a rational causal argument about it. Distribution can tell you some things, but you'll never exactly know what it is until you have other information. Otherwise, you could make enormous errors. So causal concept, everybody who studies it says, you cannot derive a causal concept from statistical claims alone. It simply doesn't work. We have to <coughs> add some other dimension. This is where the Buddhist cause and conditions come in. You have to figure out when you have something that happens and you have all the conditions for that were present when it happened, you still don't necessarily know why it happened. You still don't know. You have to try to get as close as you can to the event itself so when I push a rock off the cliff, then I could say, aha, I've just shown you directly a direct cause. I pushed it off, and it fell. I did that. Gravity? What's gravity? What do you mean? <laughs> I was just participating in gravity? No, no, I pushed it off, and it fell, right? Einstein made a very interesting thing. He said the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. But he fears that we create a society that honors the servant but has forgotten the gift. In other words, our intuitive mind and that side of our brain is what we come up with in terms of causal concepts and analyses. And that mind of ours that's purely rational is really very, it's a good servant. But we also have things which the rational mind working with its data and its statistics cannot do for us in terms of analysis, interpretation. I just put in this, this thing, if you read it, if you know what it means, tell me. This is the way the literature reads. Learning will occur if and only if co-activation of a pre- and postsynaptic cell results in postsynaptic activity sufficient to result in a reaction between an axon transfer factor and a free dendrite transfer factor within the postsynaptic dendritic matter flow. It's, it's, that's why sometimes I say we have to use an image. I will better understand this a hundred times faster and better if you could just show me an image because then my intuitive and my irrational <laughs> mind in one sense can also get into play with this. So if you ever figured that one out, let me know. So the question is that a lot of people say the brain needs more than pre-conscious mechanisms to learn about the world. 
how can how can we learn about the world? Is is the brain illogical? It's like what what Chomsky says. His his belief is that the experience available to a baby is too sparse for language learning. A baby comes into the world and starts learning language right away, and Chomsky says, how can that be? They don't have enough experience if all they have is what they have experienced since they were born. It's too sparse. There has to be a, another aspect to learning a language which is built in and which is, as I say, a priori. It is already in the baby when it's born. It's an innate ability. It's in the structure of the brain itself. Without that structure and deep structure of language, he says, I, I can't understand how a baby could learn to, to a language with the lack of experience which they have. It's somehow built in. So we have in Buddhism the whole thing then. Once we get into this area, it's, it's like Indra's net, the interpenetration of everything. The brain itself is functioning in, in ways which are pre-conscious to some degree. And how do we take what the brain does for us and how we can deal with it and understand that at the same time we have endlessness. And that endlessness means that you can never find any patterns that are permanent. Any pattern you find can be changed in the next moment because you'll have something new. So from that perspective, Indra's net is saying at one level, there's no essence between our view of the world through our senses. There's no essence to the endlessness of the reflections that we have. We have endlessness is represented by a symbol. But here's the state we're in. For 10 years, they worked to map the galaxies. They finally mapped all the galaxies that are within 380 million light years of us. And that, in, that has reached the grand sum of 43,000 galaxies. They now map them. And they can make this map of them. And we can see what's within 380 million light years of us, a lot, 46,000 of these galaxies. The estimate of the number of galaxies that could be within the realm of detection is considered at this time to be estimated at 176 billion. We've only done 43,000. What do we know? And in endlessness, if we can imagine that there may be multiple universes, not just a, uni a verse, but multiverses, the figures grow larger and larger. So when the, when the Buddhists are talking about all of this, and we begin to see in the text the sutra of cause and conditions, it's, it is not just enough to say, I know why something happens. I doubt it. I doubt that I know. I am so sure that by, I understand all the conditions and the cause for why I take a drink of water. But when I begin to look at this vastness of what we have to deal with in terms of causation, I think Pearl is right. Causality is one of the great mysteries. And the Buddhist understood this and said, while it's a great mystery, we have to at least figure out to what degree we need to know about it in order to live our lives. 
and it's living our lives with causation. That is what we do every day. We try to decide how to learn from what we think we're seeing, which we think we're seeing cause and effect. And that's what we base ourselves on. But the Buddhists have suggested that what we think to be cause and effect is probably empty. It is empty of the pattern because we simply do not know whether that's the totality of the picture, whether that pattern that we see is going to hold if we get a wider picture or not. So um, it's nice to feel that we don't know everything. And that's why I gave you that picture of Grobstein who said, our only hope is to be a little less wrong. Okay, thank you.